Hi, good night everyone. I hope that everybody's very excited because we have another very special guest. We have the head of the Biba Association, Mr. Gregory McConney. And I hope everyone has their questions ready because we would have given you some advanced prep. We also have a very special minister who is going to be here. Everyone has and their questions ready because we would have given you some advanced prep. <laughs> I hope that everyone is ready with your questions for both persons. I will warn you though, tonight is not going to be political. Tonight is going to be focused on business because we are going to have a political session with this person tomorrow. So for those of you who've been keep, keeping track of Jeremy and my pages, you might have an idea of who's coming tonight, but I would prefer if you keep it business tonight because we're going to get very political tomorrow. So you can save all your lashes for him tomorrow if you have any and all your praise, all your questions, everything you can do political ways tomorrow, but tonight we're getting down to business. So introducing you, we know Dwayne, everybody knows Dwayne, so. Hi. And yes, Mr. McConney, hey. can you give us an introduction to what you're going to be talking about tonight? Sure. Um, I just want to give people a better understanding of what international business is all about, what it means for Barbados, and some of the benefits it, it provides to our society, and, and just frankly why we, we think it's a very important sector and has a big role to play in the economy of Barbados. So just before we start, we can just give people a little time to catch up because some people are logging in as we speak. Mm -hmm. um, the Minister Dombolinis will be joining us in this session. As Greg said, tonight we're going to be talking strictly about uh, we keeping it within our, our mantra of what we want to do, which is how do we move Barbados forward? How do we, um, what is in there that can get us to where we need to be? Yes. So. So, yeah, um, I guess a lot of people talk about uh, the word offshore, and that, that's kind of developed a, a little bit of a negative con connotation over the years, it's become a little bit of a bad word. So we mm -hmm. kind of prefer international business. Uh, to, it's a better description of what it's really all about. It's not, you know, offshore kind of songs, like stuff stashed away in an yeah. account somewhere. But what we're talking about here is not people just sticking money in an account, a bank account in some palm tree island to, to hide away. These are genuine, legitimate businesses that use various jurisdictions to structure their global operations. So the um, international business sector uh, has developed a number of niche areas. There's mm -hmm. insurance and reinsurance is one fairly big aspect. Mm -hmm. There is uh, wealth management, which is one of the, the areas that um, has been the focus of the strategic plan for international business. Yes. Um, and then there's just generally international trade uh, and commerce uh, in, in services and so on as well. And uh, obviously, if that's what the German gave you, goodness, sorry, sorry for being late. Uh, he he gave a, a proper excuse, so please uh, don't crucify him. Well, if it's 10 o'clock news, you'll see it. <laughs> no problem. Um, so, a lot of people ask, you know, are they these legitimate businesses? You have some major global corporations that, that utilize international structures as a part of their planning. Uh, big multinationals. Here in Barbados you'll have uh, a number, a couple of reinsurance, international reinsurance companies like Manual Life and London Life. You'd have um, some big global manufacturer and retailing with, um, I think probably the biggest one is Gildan. Yes. Uh, they employ a couple hundred yeah. people here. Uh, that's probably that's the ideal for us in terms of what we would like to see in terms of the international business sector, those big global multinationals centering their business here, employing significant numbers of, of people. Yeah. We take a little brief pause. A welcome, I, Honorable <laughs> Minister. <laughs> so at least I know, hey, at least I know if you're coming out. At least I know if you're coming out, I don't want. Just, just <laughs> to give you. <laughs> 
the preamble that we have before we started the video tonight yeah. is not going to be political, so you can rest easy, take a breath. We're oh, only wow. talking business That's tonight. <laughs> because we're giving you all the political lashes tomorrow. <laughs> We've been forewarned. So, yes, just to catch you guys up, we would have just started to go into giving persons an idea of what the offshore sector is involved with. And it was interesting some of the examples he brought up because a lot of people probably never even thought of some of those companies as offshore. Mm. And to just give some of the viewers an idea of what qualifies a business to be considered as offshore. And I think one of the things that Greg pointed out today as well, and I think it's a good analogy, is, is he prefers to use the word international business. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, as I said, that's kind of, it is liberally business done internationally, and mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's the, the primary focus. Um, the, and it's not just the entities that people would traditionally consider to be international business entities, so not just entities uh, licensed by the Ministry of International Business or by the um, FSC. Uh, a lot of international business now is actually being done through regular Barbados companies that are not uh, subject to the special um, incentive legislation where they make use of holding company, uh, favorable holding company mm -hmm. legislation that we have as well as um, the foreign currency earnings credit yes. uh, facilities that we have. So a lot of international business is now conducted in in what would be considered to be technically domestic entities. Right. And a lot of that doesn't actually get captured in the statistics at the mm -hmm. moment when we talk about the number of uh, international businesses. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that is another factor that, um, that you, you need to look at. And those domestic entities are used for a number of purposes as well. Uh, one of them being able to access the tax treaty network that Barbados has developed. We have a significant tax treaty network and um, a lot of the traditional international business companies uh, are carved out of the benefits of that. So in using the domestic company, they have access to that. And it goes beyond tax. A lot of business is actually um, driven as well by what we were known as bilateral investment treaties, where you have Barbados has a number of them alongside their tax treaties, and that provides protection for assets. Where you know where you're investing into a new and emerging economy or a new area, um, where there may be political risk or whatever, those bilateral investment treaties are very important mm -hmm. for businesses making very significant uh, capital contributions. Okay. One of the questions from the audience, one of the ladies was asking if film crews coming in to shoot commercials, music videos, movies, etc., if they would count as interna international business. Um, I don't think that that would really fit our model. It would more be if we had businesses set up here that were producing film and, and products okay. for international distribution. Um, you know, I, I think that's, that's, we want that more long-term, stable, businesses based here, uh, incorporated here, and doing business internationally from here, as opposed to, I mean, that's nice to have, and that's more a, a tourism, I guess, uh, product, as opposed to international business product. I, I have a question for the <coughs> Minister. Why, why do you think that the international business sector receives such a bad, uh, a bad name, a bad press from the big countries? You know, for some parts in the big country, I think it's because of a lot of misinformation. What you call a big country, that's referring to developed countries, so invariably are the source of international business for us. Usually for far the arguments that these entities are coming to the lower tax jurisdictions like Barbados are eroding their tax base in, in, in the developed states. So for them it's an economic or financial issue where they think they're losing revenue are not gaining or getting revenue that otherwise should accrue to their to their jurisdictions. Um, that's the biggest argument they put forward. The other argument is that uh, international jurisdiction uh, like Barbados is so not as well as other places, perhaps facilitate um, structures 
that do not fall in line with what they expected in developed, in developed countries, such as for a tax avoidance, tax evasion, or illicit activities. Um, so I think those are the fundamental reasons why they, why they look at us. But a lot of it is driven on international tax policy matters. Yeah. I think a lot of it is a, a misunderstanding as well. Uh, so they see the they see businesses making profits and so on offshore, but those profits eventually uh, revert to those to those countries. They make the, the businesses more competitive. For the the Rothman School in Toronto at the University of Toronto, Professor Hijazi actually conducted a study on two, how yeah two studies on how Canadian companies using offshore jurisdictions to invest globally actually are improving the Canadian economy. So if he did a comparison where if they invested directly into a foreign jurisdiction or if they invested through Barbados or other international jurisdictions into those uh, of international jurisdictions and the benefit of investing through the international, the, the financial centers was more significant than the Canadian company di investing directly into the, the target jurisdiction. So his, his thing is more so to do with skills that they acquire when they invest, or is it to do with the tax competitiveness? I don't think the skills, I think it's more tax competitive. And, and for example, just to look on that, the Canadians will say that um, Barbados Land is about 70 billion Canadian dollars in investment, Canadian investment through Barbados on a basis. And there's some folks in Canada, including Canadian Parliament, who give the view that that is 70 billion dollars that should be in the Canadian economy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The truth of the matter is that that is the value, cumulative value of the goods or services or entities that um, are Canadian owned that operate out of Barbados going globally. Yeah. Yeah. Now, such entities um, would come to Barbados. Set a structure to Greg or whoever, mm -hmm. and then do business in multiple jurisdictions. Benefit from either the treaties we have, by that investment treaty or double taxation treaties, or other arrangements we have with other countries that allow them to, to, to accrue profits in Barbados, pay one half percent tax. And on the arrangement with Canada, the, 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 the profits go back to Canada, it goes as any surplus. Yeah, yeah, without, without, any, further without any further tax in Canada. I have seen how. Such structures have benefited the Canadian economy immensely Absolutely. because clients have been able to take that money back into Canada by buildings and standard Canadian domestic operations. But had they, as Greg was rightly saying, decided <coughs> to go directly from Canada, let's say into Africa or Cuba, for example, they would not have been able to have the level of protection or to make the kind of profits that they could otherwise make through it. So the tax treaty then, the bilateral tax agreements then are a fundamental advantage that we have, uh, especially for Canadian companies. But then one would ask yourself, if the uh, Canadian government, say they're running on a deficit, would say that uh, you're missing, because of that same bilateral agreement, some kind of addition, some kind of surplus that can help, uh, let's say, deal with Canadian deficits. So if that's an uh, argument that is brought to the fore, how then as a jurisdiction do we protect ourselves or legitimate? I know it would stem from what you said, but now how does this get back into the Canadian government through consumption taxes? Who, if you get them from it, yeah. I mean, the, the Canadian um, the Hijazi study actually showed that when those Canadian companies uh, invest to our, our jurisdiction, the level of exports that those Canadian that Canada now makes actually goes up mm -hmm. significantly more. Uh, so, so there are then a direct benefit there in terms of the exports. The profits get repatriated to Canada. Uh, Canadian businesses, as the minister has indicated, then have more wealth in order to invest, in order to return to the Canadian shareholders. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Canadian shareholders certainly pay tax. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it, it's not really a formal escape attack, and, and there is that additional competitiveness and profitability coming back, which when it ends up in the hands of an individual, they pay tax on it. Right. So then, if you just tell me to go this off, because I can assume I have the answers, but again, to hear from two experts 
and you think it makes a big difference, especially for the audience for me. And I can hear some hosts like it, that they're asking them, how do you deal with the competitive lag or the fact mm -hmm. that you've got a threat from jurisdictions such as Bermuda that had the extension of the treaties, but rather recently, the Bermudas, the Cayman Islands that are known for things like of what we currently deal with here, the insurance and hedge funds and all yeah. that. How do you then deal with that and still make more of a compelling case? Perhaps so I can tackle a little bit of response here, mm -hmm. because Greg can do the technical things he said in the day to day. But the Canadian authorities did a few years ago take a stance that anyone who has a tax exchange information agreement with them, similar what we've had around here, gets similar benefits as Barbados get. However, Barbados offers much more than a lower tax rate. Exactly. Yeah. Bar Barbados offers a, a high quality workforce, a high quality of life, uh, living, sorry. Uh, we have a reputation of being in this business for much longer than several other competitors. And Barbados is known as a domicile of substance, mm -hmm. not just brick and mortar operations. So there's much more than tax at stake here. Um, and, and I think that that is where we really be pushing it, like Canadian and many other end. But where you, you deal with these things day to day? Yeah, I mean, um, Bermuda and Cayman, they are not tricky jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. There is still, a, a lot of tax practitioners will still value having a jurisdiction which has treaties, tax treaties. Yes. Treaties, mm -hmm. as to treaties are exchange. only exchange of information. Right. Treaties provide other protections in terms of dispute resolution and tiebreaker rules and also all sorts of things like that that, that make a big difference to the tax practitioner who is looking to set structures. tax exchange information are pretty much not really worth much these days. <laughs> in the sense that since then, we've all signed on to the Maldivian Convention, the automatic information. So all jurisdiction, I think, has changed one. Well, most more hundred of our countries have signed on. Except the USA. They're different. You won't go push it. They're different kind of fish in any respect. <laughs> so now there's somewhat of a level in the playing field when it comes to such across the board. So then there's not, not sorry about that. Uh, there is, there's no real need then to panic just yet with respect to drying up of business in Barbados due to I, I don't <laughs> think there's ever been a need to panic. Mm. Um, what we have to do is why others are looking at challenges, we must explore opportunities. Mm. And that we keep talking here about Canada, but Barbados in recent years recently gone into Mexico, uh, Colombia have taken delegations there, the private sector is gone as well. Um, we are getting business out of, out of Europe, I mean in December alone, I think we have about 76 or so new companies uh, coming into Barbados as a result of, of changes, I guess, out of the UK system as well. Um, and so it's not just Canada, we're not right. putting all of our eggs in one basket. So we, we are, we're trying to stay ahead of the curve to be more proactive and to find uh, new opportunities. Before, yeah. before we get into looking at the, the opportunities and stuff, one of the things that um, one of the things with the purpose of this here, and I think Google has been trying over the years, is to dispel the gears and myths mm -hmm. about the international business sector. And one of the things, just dressing it back a little bit, um, just for the people who don't know or understand the international business sector. So it's, first of all, it's like, why have the international business mm -hmm. sector? And what are the actual benefits to having an uh, international business sector here? What, what does the international business sector really contribute to the economy of our business? And just to jump in a bit, because a lot of people are under the impression that the international business sector gets, just gets a lot of concessions, lower tax rates than everybody else, and they don't exactly generate that much foreign exchange or employment to justify all of the benefits they receive from us. So I am not sure if that's something that either of you would like to clarify. Oh, with pleasure. <laughs> Before the international business and financial services sector, this economy will collapse. Mm -hmm. uh, the simple truth of the matter is that uh, based on the, on the last uh, analysis we did, I think we felt in 13, 14 years, uh, the sector is estimated to contribute about $900 million to the Barbies economy, mm -hmm. second only to tourism. Mm -hmm. And I've always argued the point though, for every dollar that comes in on the tourism rubric, mm -hmm. you have to ask how much of that goes back up to satisfy the tourism industry. I suspect it's probably close to 7 7 cents of each dollar. Mm -hmm. In the national business sector, it's perhaps the reverse. 
Mm. Because the wealthy man comes in, comes in to pay taxes, pay rents, salaries, uh, all the incidental expenses, office supplies. office supplies, the other thing too. Quite a number of the individuals who come into Barbados, particularly high net worth individuals, to do international business, yes. board of directors meetings, shareholders meetings, tax advisors, yeah. whoever, they are counting as stories. Yeah, they don't have any facts. Picking up some your numbers. Yeah, but I'm not saying it's tourism or international business. As a matter of fact, we, we, we are working a lot closer together these days because we need both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I would say that the international business sector. Uh, continues to make an immense contribution to this economy. Without it, we would really be really, really behind times. And in terms of employment as well, I mean, the, the, the skill levels within the international business sector are quite high. Uh, the, they estimate around just over 4,000 people employed within the sector. And, you know, people tend to think of it as expats, but they're only one expat for every 10 people mm -hmm. employed in the sector. So mm -hmm. a lot of Barbadians benefit in terms of employment and, and good quality jobs. Okay, we have a question here mm -hmm. from one of the esteemed economic analysts for First Caribbean. He sure. would have had an article today where he would have touched on money printing. But his question is, uh, given the importance of international business to our economy, is as it's reported as the second largest source of fixed and highest source of corporation tax, when will more data on the sector's performance be more easily and publicly available for everyone to analyze and better understand its impact? And I will add, in a way that the average Barbadian can understand. That's the <laughs> <laughs> my, my simple answer is from this weekend. Uh, for example, I can tell you that 2016, we had at the end of the year, December 31st, 2016, some 3,906 licensed entities in the sector mm -hmm. uh, as captured by the international business sector. And that's about a 13% increase over 2015, mm -hmm. which had 3,449. But it's a very good question and one I fully um, um, endorse because just a few days ago, uh, my ministry had a meeting with stakeholders, oh, that's including right. last Friday actually, Biba. Uh, who's an excellent partner with the industry, with the ministry, uh, Central Bank, Ministry of Finance, and other stakeholders, uh, statistical department, they're the processing. So, as Minister, I convened a meeting with stakeholders saying, look, we need to do a better job at measuring the contribution of the sector to the economy. I don't think we do a good job at it right now. No. And we measure it according to the number of licensed entities, mm -hmm. which is very misleading. I just gave you the stats on licensed entities. But as Greg and others will tell you, more and more business these days is being done through regular Barbados companies that would fly on our radar in international business. And then the, the way in which it's currently measured in terms of contribution to the macroeconomy, mm -hmm. I think is rather antiquated, very right? manual, very right? going too fast. Mm -hmm. So we said, look, no, we're starting by redefining or defining international business within the context of Barbados. Um, and there are systems in place to capture the data in a timely fashion, measure it, and of course to quickly disseminate it to all stakeholders. So that, that is something that we, we're not putting that off for six months. That is something we started to do uh, immediately. What have been some of the challenges you've faced? Because you mentioned technology. How difficult is it to use the technology to be able to gather the data that you're talking about? Because more often than not, Data mining is made easier based on the technology that you have. How the technology is not the issue as far as mm -hmm. I'm concerned. Perhaps it's a unwillingness to use it or to deploy it across the system. Mm -hmm. If you take, for example, a call the phrase intellectual property office, it started about a year and a half ago or so to allow for online filing of companies yes. to do searches and whatnot. I'm proud of that, but I'm not proud of the rate at which it has developed. I think we still have to do some more work to really get it become the norm. Mm -hmm. but, but we think that we find it, such a, it must be a system that allows us to immediately capture appropriate data, mm -hmm. like nationalities of directors, um, mm -hmm. source of business, that kind of information that stops somebody from having to leave through paper documents and, and, and find the information. Mm -hmm. So the simple answer is not enough is being used with the technology to help us capture and analyze the data we want. But it's not that the technology is not available. Okay. Yeah. Well, one, of the, one of the things that uh, <coughs> I mentioned to Greg is that if you, if you raise 
every article of the incoming Libra president, um, when they had their synopsis, you could virtually just change the name and date, and they have the same lament every year. What you're saying there now seems to be addressing some of what they have mentioned in the, in the letter. So at least we're going in the right direction, but do you, do you think that the person coming after Greg is going to be writing the same, the same incoming letter? You have to ask Greg that, I don't know. <laughs> I used to be a I used to be a director at Viva many years ago. Uh, I don't know. They see perhaps it's a case where where we need to sit down more and talk about our successes and our failures and why we haven't done well. What I would say is that before Viva, this sector could not be where it is. Viva has genuinely been an excellent partner uh, to the sector. Did advice people talk a lot, for example, tourism and whatnot. Biba has, a, has been a classic good example of a true private sector partner with government. A lot of the initiatives that we've created in the industry, a lot of new products that we've created to, to, to service the industry has come from Biba. Even things as far as having to draft legislation, maybe I should say that. But the right policy paper that Biba has being able through their various subcommittees and president and executive director, Mr. Holmes and whatnot, to be there at the table guiding the process. Mm -hmm. the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are classic examples of how it should be done. We should be setting the policy, but the policy has to be informed by what the members or exactly. what the what the consumers want. Um, Greg, I was put this to you. Um, one of the things that challenges that some people in the, the industry tell me is they, they refer to the, how the legislation, the AML laws were written, the AML mm -hmm. legislation was written, mm -hmm. and the segregated cell. They're saying that the segregated cell doesn't actually catch, well, you'll have to explain the segregated cell. <laughs> I know, but some of the legislation doesn't actually capture what you're supposed to do. How does Viva address that? Because the idea obviously is to, to go after the business. So so, AML, sorry, by the way, for those watching, is anti money laundering. Because I, I know what happens when the. Because I remember we had. I got a phone call from someone in the insurance industry, and they're asking me about factual and laws of course, anything because what happened when the laws were written, it, it captured all the low hanging fruit and things that really doesn't really go into play with AML. Mm -hmm. What's your take on how the legislation was written? Yeah, I, I think oh, the AML. Um, Legislation that was adopted, or the AML guidelines that were adopted mm -hmm. by a number of the agencies, uh, were more geared towards banking. Mm -hmm. I think it was unfortunate that the the definition of a financial institution was more based on what piece of legislation you were um, incorporated or licensed under, as opposed to what your activity was. Mm -hmm. So. Most of the AML internationally is kind of focused on deposit taking. But in the insurance sector, it'd be focused on <clears throat> cash value, uh, life policies and annuities and so on. Unfortunately, our legislation uh, defines a well, international business company as a financial institution, even if it's someone selling wine. Or, so technically, if you are a customer of an international business company and you come to buy a glass or a, bar, a case of wine from the international business company, you need to have KYC information. Not really the intent. KYC know your customer. Know your customer, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and again, on the reinsurance, the insurance side, most jurisdictions do not subject to reinsurance to mm. AML. Uh, Bermuda certainly excludes it. Mm -hmm. And property and general property and casualty insurance, so like your car insurance and so on, oh, all of that tends not to be included within mm -hmm. AML, whereas our our legislation and our guidelines did include it and that that's been frustrating yeah. in yeah. the industry. Yeah, you do you do hear that company that trying to tailor AML legislation to certain business sectors outside of the direct banking industry is very difficult. And then getting some of the requirements, especially for existing customers who would have gotten say policies mm. from eons ago and you can't get them in and yet the regulators are expecting you to have certain information on foot. And the difficulties, how, how has it been for the other sectors? I mean, it, it is a challenge. I think 
there are certain areas that are risk areas that they, mm -hmm. you have to do it. Mm -hmm. it it's, you know, it's, you, you understand the reasons why. What the, the challenges we have are where internationally other players aren't asking for that information. Mm -hmm. uh, our companies need to go and ask for it. It's very, very difficult. To, and to expensive. This is why they picked up, for lack of a better term, local companies in the as well. Mm -hmm. And the insurance companies are the ones that are experiencing the, the where they should not have really been captured. Right. And the international in, the international insurance and reinsurance companies, that's, that's one of the bigger, the, the areas with the bigger challenges. And also, as I said, the international business companies that are not financial in nature. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there are big international business companies here that sell alcohol internationally, for example. So, you know, someone, they're, they're shipping alcohol from the, their production facilities, they do international sales through Barbados, and technically the customers that are buying, the shops in Europe and the US that are buying alcohol from them have to provide KYC information. Yeah. And that, that is a challenge. Yep. So, yeah. so I mean, staying on challenge because we want to head straight into the option invite. I want to just go through a couple of things. Is uh, sure, you know. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, no. All right. So we, we experience challenges in terms of legislation, and obviously, I'm assuming that you're saying that the people and the legislators can be working a little more closely together um, in terms of trying to make sure that it captures what's supposed to do and keep us within the guidelines, so we don't stray. Um, the segregated cell one, I don't know too much about it, but I just got my, I used to get my ear cheered up there, chewed up by one person who used to set up trust companies mm -hmm. and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he was saying that it didn't actually, there was, you couldn't really use it. Is that? Uh, I wouldn't say you couldn't use it. I think, yeah. are you talking about the protected, the, 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 the incorporated cell? Yes, correct. Right. There was an initial period of time when the incorporated cell legislation had initially been passed, and there were systems and processes in place in order to actually go ahead. And, and so you had the, the legislation, but you didn't have the processes within the FSC and so on to be able to license them and incorporate them. Um, so I think that's a challenge we have sometimes where you know we may be able to get a piece of legislation or an amendment or some new product through uh, legislatively, but we haven't put in place the building blocks mm -hmm. within the operations to be able to make it uh, operable. Okay, just a Positive comment coming in from one of our viewers. He directed the comment to the Honorable Minister. Thanks for coming on to the show. If the rest of your government took a leaf out of your book and engaged the public the way that you do, it would go a long way. Hey, you better come tomorrow to continue passing the message on. <laughs> <laughs> Please come do. Tomorrow. I don't know if passing the message on will make a difference, but at least you would try. I, I, I can just get back to one other yeah. thing I want to point I want to make. Like, no problem. And this mentioned the seventy billion dollars. Uh, you know, yeah. people overseas or, or the media picks up on that, and it makes it sound like there's seventy billion dollars in a bank mm. account, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's being hidden, mm -hmm. and no one knows about it. A lot of this money is. I can personally speak of a few billion of that. That right now is invested in property in the UK through a Barbados company, communications towers in France, mm -hmm. toll roads in Brazil, mm. telecommunications for toll roads in Chile, and uh, electricity distribution facilities in, in, in Chile. So that is money that has come through Barbados and gone to real businesses operating around the world. So it's not that, that's a few billion dollars, not sitting in a bank account here. That's conduited through a barrier company for efficiency purposes and competitiveness purposes, making use of tax treaties and deployed globally. That's that's how international that's business That's a major works. distinction too because it would take away some of the acrimony that a lot of the agents also feel towards the industry itself. <coughs> uh, and for me, 
the good thing is that you, you are also proving that it's just more than just some offshore bank facilitating some fat cats, but meaningful capital mm -hmm. investments and showing that Barbados, even if it's other people's money, which is how you should really be doing investment, is doing meaningful investments outside of the country. In fact, if we were to even borrow from what we might have been talking about tomorrow, a new economic model for Barbados has to be centered on the ability of a country to invest even if it's your own capital or someone else's capital. Yeah, because yeah, it's those dividends and whatnot that come back to support what's going on here. Yeah. If I can say a quick point there, because I'm not sure that there's really a lot of animosity towards the industry. There may be an abundance of ignorance as to what the industry is, and ignorance in general sense of term. And, and that is why it falls to the ministry, to the Viva, to all stakeholders, to constantly do their engaging the public as to what this sector is, what it's about, who's in it, what's the contributing economy, and, and to provide the opportunities. I want to touch back quickly on the issue of money laundering and the new rules mm -hmm. of engagement. It is not just about the, fin the companies that are directly engaged in financial services. The whole narrative and structures have moved now more towards getting to things like beneficial ownership of entities. Um, you know, so we're not just concerned now about um, moving the money, per se, but, but who owns what, mm -hmm. what structures are being used. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that I can say that we have a running battle here in Barbados with some other partners abroad uh, who are insisting that we must have more information readily available in the public space about beneficial ownership of companies. Yes. And I've taken the position that that will not happen in Barbados. I don't mind watch if I have any say about it. Because I think it defies the purpose of a company in the first instance mm -hmm. to have a difference between directors and shareholders and the shareholders must be protected. Uh, but I know there are some countries that you mentioned earlier doing some of the more developed countries who are insisting that we must have in a public space information on beneficial owners. I've taken the view that such information should remain with the company secondaries, corporate trusts and service providers. Of course, you have to have it accessible to competent authorities, mm -hmm. and that must be clearly defined as who competent authorities are, and also have systems in place that are clearly defined as to how you access the information. Okay. I don't think a policeman in a criminal uniform should turn up at somebody's office one day and say, I want to see all your documents on who own the companies in here. Yeah. They have rights. That's, that's yeah. more of a job for Brad. <laughs> well, I mean, it a job for Brad. But, but that, that must all be tied into the new the paradigm shift in terms of what is anti money laundering issues and how we are not to address them around the world. Because there are also security issues around those things. So, like some, some of the, the Latin American business and so on mm -hmm. is also, it's not necessarily tax driven, it's about some, in some ways about asset protection mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and also a little bit about privacy, not privacy in the, from the point of view of hiding. Um, from paying tax, privacy from a confidentiality point of view, because if certain in certain countries, if you uh, are known to be wealthy, your family may be at risk of yep. kidnapping and ransom and so on, and and some of that actually drives the the structures of Latin America and so on, uh, so that people are comfortable that their wealth is mm -hmm. protected for their family. But their family is also safe in their yes. own environment because it's not necessarily public knowledge yeah. who owns what. And that's a major one. And then, just before you go, Minister, the, um, I don't know how many people in here know, for instance, that Apple, as the world's largest company, uses some, a similar need or has a similar need with respect to IP, intellectual property. And they normally register the intellectual properties first in Jamaica because of the same confidentiality born by the fact that the Jamaicans don't have the technology that allows competitors to access intellectual property rights of Apple and their plans and whatnot. Cool. So yeah, it's so what might be viewed as a split actually is rather big, a big positive for them. Considering mm -hmm. that's that's millions of dollars literally in ideas um, generated in Jamaica every year so they get a lot of patent funds first for Apple. Yeah. So even a structure, the international business sector here if confidentiality is a key uh, function of it or a key yeah, key function or, 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 or I guess figure 
then maybe something that can be pushed going forward is the whole idea of setting up intellectual properties. Structures or structures here to guard intellectual property in Barbados. I, I think that would be a major one. That, that, that is being worked on. My father, I guess, uh, uh, said Barbados will sign on. Can't the pool a few weeks ago for us to sign on to Madrid Protocol. Yes. It basically means if you if you register IP uh, in the jurisdiction, Barbados is now recognized pretty much across the world. Beautiful. Okay. With the white uh, protocol. Beautiful. But going back to the issue, it's not just about tax and uh, tax rates. Asset protection and confidentiality that doesn't facilitate corruption is part of what we offer as well. I can safely say to you that, you know, with the, with the political unrest and the people we've had in, in Venezuela mm. uh, over mm. the years, we have seen a large, a sizable number of entities established in Barbados that Venezuela known mm. uh, for use of asset protection, even owning uh, structures or owning assets back in Venezuela on assets in other jurisdictions around the place. And it's, yes, we have a treaty in place, but it's more driven by the need to protect the assets. The bilateral yeah, right. investment treaty is there. Mm -hmm. you know, all these things work. That's beautiful. He hasn't met the Ralph of Maduro just yet, because you know, he's been sniffing around the Caribbean. Well, <laughs> we have some other things to work <laughs> Truthfully. So, mm -hmm. one, um, this is my favorite part. We talk about challenges so that people can understand really and truly what we have and what we're dealing with and this is my favorite part. What are the opportunities that you have going forward and, and what's the time frame on this? Um, I think where I can start, the, a lot of people see that's the base erosion of profit shift in uh, the regime and they work with us that being there as a friend. To us, I think that also that has opportunity. That is Barbados, a massive competitive advantage versus Cayman, Bermuda, mm -hmm. all those other little jurisdictions. When you look at the workforce in Cayman and Bermuda, they're predominantly expats. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Barbados can produce, can, has a skilled, sizable workforce. It's a great place to live. It has more infrastructure than any of those other territories as well. So, and we've always sought businesses of substance, like give that and, you know, those types of businesses. And that's what we want here, and that's what BAX drives. Mm -hmm. BAX wants profits to follow substance. So if we can get the substance here, then that's that's what we need to go after. Can you define for the general audience um, what you mean by substance? Well, Subst and a follow-up question, also, is the drip protocol going to be signed? Mm -hmm. I have to come back on the actual to sign it, but you don't have me did a proof it to, to be done, and I'll check the restaurant a couple of first and more that, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <laughs> substance. Substance is actually physical activity happening in the, in the country. So like, BVI has, what, 500,000 or 600,000 registered entities, but they're literally names on a register, and uh, substance is Businesses having employees on the ground doing real activity and uh, producing things or providing services in the local jurisdiction. And that's what um, that is all about. So you don't have situations where shell companies run a transaction to it, make millions and millions of dollars, but everyone knows the the real economic value was created somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Substance is about creating the economic value mm -hmm. in the jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And once you're doing that, then you know you're you're back friendly. So what do we say the time frame that we can start utilizing this? No, I don't think it's a matter of time frame you realize is that we have always been focused on that. <coughs> yeah. I think that's what separates Barbados from any other jurisdiction. We look for active business. Um, we, we are able to say, look, it's not just a brass plate on a door. You go into an office, you have 50 companies on one door, and you go inside, there's just one person doing everything. Uh, we are saying, look, we have accountants, we have lawyers, we have traders, we have the whole gamut of skills necessary to run your business. And uh, we actually do have contracts signed from in Barbados. We have people who are doing invoicing, we have people who are doing the tracking of sales. And also, there's actually business going on here. 
And, and that is where Bex, Bex is something that we are not afraid of. But one, of the, one of the things that I think is important you just said here, people don't realize that we have actual physical trade index here in Barbados. Full, like what you would see in some movies with you know screens going and everybody is, is logged into their trade index. And I think that's one of the things that people don't really understand that we actually do have true businesses, as you said. As staff, as staff, like Barbados, as, staff, like Barbados yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and there are other services as well um, accounting services, um, treasury services, mm -hmm. and, and some, sometimes these things are not even tax driven, they are. Um, cost effectiveness and service quality driven. So, you know, Bermuda is a very expensive place to operate. Mm -hmm. um, what we can do in Barbados would cost usually about, about half what it would cost to do the same thing mm -hmm. in Bermuda in terms of providing sports staff. There are operations that provide a uh, significant amount of company and administration for entities, not Barbadian entities, here. And it's not anything to do with tax, it's about service levels, efficiency, and quality. So, so we know this, um, how are, what, what is the method that, that we, we are going out to, to, to promote this? Because I know that in my previous life when I, had, um, when I was in the, oh, in the initial international business, um, they had active trade um, missions and um, that had a lot more it was a lot more government and private sector initiative going out going into the legal firms in the different territories going into the company mm -hmm. firms mm -hmm. and basically driving the initial business that mm -hmm. mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. that, that is still going on uh, a matter of fact invest barbados which is tasked with uh, promoting the international sector do have an aggressive work plan to continue every year i know for example um, mid-march Minister Darcy Boyce today in London, England going to Rochelle, talk to the service providers and potential clients and whatnot. Um, and then the other missions we have planned for, for Canada in the summer in Toronto, uh, sorry, Colombia, Mexico, other jurisdictions so over the coming year. But what is instructive is that all these government led min, uh, missions principally consist of those involved with the industry in the private side in Barbados. And secondly, this is an industry where the private sector does not wait for government to promote <laughs> or like tourism. Uh, the private sector in Barbados International they Business go ahead sector, and do it they're themselves. talking about it every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Greg must go there. He's, Greg doesn't wait on, on government to promote it. Uh, you know, the guys out there talking their parties in, in the major markets, going to the various conferences, their members of professional bodies, they attend those meetings. So a, a lot of work is going on every day, every minute. Uh, yeah. and just a question not from tonight but it was asked this question and I can't remember who so I apologize for not being able to give credit someone asked how complicated would it be to collect taxes from international business sectors in US dollars uh, or in foreign currency I would say that it actually the taxes that are paid actually comes into Barbados yeah. mm -hmm. whatever foreign currency it comes in so we are, we are collecting it just has converted to Barbados because the person yeah. mentioned some mostly the hotel industry where some of the taxes do or I got named with that's, 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 that's next week <laughs> sorry <laughs> next week's discussion yeah, just on the point of foreign currency mm. when you think of an interna international business entity by definition, they do not do any, they don't earn any of their revenue from in Barbados. So anytime they pay anything in Barbados, it is from foreign currency. Mm -hmm. and as, as, as salaries, as salaries, salaries, rent, rent tax, everything. And everything. everything. I can see this person going in terms of convertibility. Mm -hmm. Especially if they know where reserves are falling and yeah. they, they want to dock some in the US dollars. But no, no, talk, like, it's like, even more important to, to to, to attract more businesses in because it brings more Great. foreign but, currency yeah. in because it has to be it has to be convertible. Oh, yeah. No, but you, here we're here we're going with that. Yeah. Anyway, in terms of convertibility, as in lack of convertibility, suppose it is for argument's sake, and this it would take it to risk slightly from the whole gist of this, that I as an employee would prefer to be paid in U.S. dollars because they can save in U.S. Mm -hmm. dollars. Because of that, then the whole talk about Barbados' reserves going down and whatnot does not affect me. 
So I know, for instance, when I'll say who it is, there's a, a, a offshore, well, international business company mm -hmm. here that is seriously talking with this board of directors and say about the possibility of paying employees. And I, I don't know how the structure will be set up. I know in terms of money landing here, there are problems. Since but they're but not, not the, any, any individual or entity that earns, um, I guess, most of this income from yeah. inside of our business are allowed to have this transparency and consistency. Uh, it, it, it depends, I, I'm sure it's half a month, but I'd love to have an account held in the bank in Barbados in the foreign currency mm -hmm. alley. And that's and the, the issue which you, public economists and finance people, have to look at mm -hmm. is, is that capture the Finland reserves. <laughs> no. Uh, no. There, there you have it's, it. There's two different mm -hmm. levels. That's NFA. <laughs> but that's but it's, it's, it's captured in perhaps the, 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 the accounts of the banks. Yes, NFA. NFA is net foreign that's assets. Mean, but that's what you mean. So then, if he's concerned, he's at the US will not be surrendered to the central bank in part or in Berkeley. I do have less need to go on the central bank. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I, suspect, mm -hmm. I suspect what you're talking about as a separate discussion yeah. because, because the, there are other areas that are not, uh, don't really show up and they don't need of short <coughs> international business sector for really? that. So there are other leakages, yeah. you know, because we, you know, we, have, we have a neighbor offshore. We have a neighbor that has um, offshore and, and you know. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, 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 I know who you Our favorite neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> and, anyway, so that, that was. These inside jokes, you know. I know what we're talking about. I talk about inside jokes for the tourists. Since you're talking about opportunities, are there any treaties that we have in a fight? We have some collecting. perspective of having to have a specialized training and education for them. Because if really they would have helped the create and tell us what is needed and their work must by 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 um, uh, this is involve knowledge and use of the various entities you have. And right back getting back to the education side and picking up a question from here. Mm. Some of these a lot of the, the companies um, that come through here they have a lot of have some specialized skills. Are is the sector or government doing anything in, in terms of educating the people to meet the needs that may be required, especially if we go into the, the um, what you just mentioned previously? Um, I'm trying to capture some of the business from Bermuda because we're a happy place. I, I think a lot of that happens naturally over time. Uh, I, I'm aware of a number of entities that would have been established here. They, you know, when they first come, they are run by an uh, ex. Employees come out, some local people, they get trained up, and certainly I know of a number of organizations that, as 
time has gone by, the leadership of those organizations has transferred to locals. I, I can tell you when I, when I entered the industry in Barbados <coughs> as, a, as a whole operator service provider 20 years ago, you go to the meetings and, and, and Barbados were perhaps a rare presence there. Back then we say that 10% of the employees in the sector were, were, were Barbados, 90% were Hispanic. Today is totally reversed. And that has happened because companies made a deliberate effort to transfer the knowledge. Mm -hmm. We also were able to, to, to make available to a lot of our citizens opportunities to specialize in some areas. And many Barbadians recognize the opportunity like the great opportunity. So you have folks who are attorneys at law, admitted to the bar here, but you never see them in forestry because they specialize in some part of the law that relates to the national business sector. The traders who use, we have guys who do the profession accounting designation, but we then specialize in areas that relate to yep. the sector. Yes. Such like. So we, it, it's evolved over time. And I, and I actually believe the sector we live this at about to do that and we've seen the tremendous benefits. Because contrary to what people think, it costs a lot to send expats into Barbados to do the work. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have a couple... Uh, no, sorry, I, mm -hmm. I was actually pointing on the book to make. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so people, people believe that when, when you bring an expat down, you are there for the company. Mm -hmm. so the, the only time that a company in my, in my time would think of bringing an expat down is when there's really truly not a skill set so, here. Yeah. Right. And, and the in most of the interest, most of the interest it was either the person stayed on here and they've been here for the last 30 years, or, and they, have, or, they, have, or they have trained people on to take the position. Mm -hmm. I know the company I started out with, um, the person there that was my senior, he's now running. And he was junior to the other person. And, and that happened in two or three organizations. Um, and I know quite a few organizations in fact, many of the of many international business organizations, by and large, are run by Barbadians. And I think and that's one of the one of the myths mm -hmm. that that gets dispel. You know, we need to dispel here in the sector. The sector actually is actively hiring a better quality um, um, and a more educated person and, and being able to utilize. Because um, I know that you know, that Biba does things with like UE and, and stuff like that yeah. as well during yeah. the, the week. I'm trying yeah. to manage. I know I know people that do actuarial science and they're at, and, and, and they're actually working in companies here and actually underwriting large reinsurance contracts mm -hmm. and they're all agent. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and, and there is a move towards that and I think that's one of the forces with the sector that people don't really understand. Mm -hmm. Am I out of school? No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have several questions from the audience, so trying to make sure we don't lose them. I have Niraj. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question from Niraj Ben Simal. Given that this broadcast is enabled by Facebook and Barbados is known to have large smartphone and broadband penetration, has there been any effort to reach out to Silicon Valley companies such as Facebook, Google, etc., to have offices here? And what would be their hurdles? Yeah, um, I don't know specific uh, specific efforts in that area. I know mm -hmm. Ireland has kind of got that market locked yeah. down uh, in terms of technology and so on. And, you know, I think we we got we to gotta look for things that are our size. And, um, you know, we want to keep our mind open, but we also need to just maybe pick a couple of areas that we can specialize in and we put at and not necessarily try to go after the, the areas that other people have specialized and become good at. The other, uh, the answer to the question also, I refer back to you is, mm -hmm. are you sure that they don't have a presence in my race already? Because it's not public information, so who owns what? That, that's Maybe the other problem. Silicon Valley, and I don't know it's a problem. It may be an opportunity that we offer. Many of these entities may rather have a presence in Barbados that they own intellectual property rights, uh, or they may be used for a certain But we don't know. We don't know, um, and, and yes, I think what we're looking at here is how do we get an Apple or Google here that may employ hundreds of Barbadians uh, so you can see a big sign saying Apple or Google here, and that's, that's good. Uh, what, what is being done about that? Well, I, I perhaps can only proffer 
that, that wherever possible the rest of our ways and others are marketing that. But what do we have to market? We don't have large numbers of bodies. What we do have is the skill sets to do it. What I will say though, the opportunity lies in getting young Barbados in particular to be able to develop the apps and the other stuff that need it that we can then sell on to the Google and, and the other uh, uh, entities around the place. Well, I'll insert a, a plug here. I have a younger cousin, Terry Marshall, who has developed an education app and he is a Barbadian, of course, but he's living in the United States. And he is currently in Silicon Valley trying to have his app promoted. He came down here to Barbados to promote it amongst several secondary schools here. So the efforts are being made, but it almost seems as though you have to leave, develop these things, and then be able to get the audience. You don't hear these stories of local Barbadians who do develop apps and have that ability to be able to reach out. And I think finally, yeah. because you're yet to fuse entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. in IT in Barbados. So we got a guy who is a who is a good good at what he does in terms of sitting and taking not just IT. And, well, I think not just IT. I but find he was yeah. IT as an example. Yeah. So a guy may be a good uh, developer. Correct. Uh, but is not a good business person. Correct. Or is not given the support. Does have an ecosystem that fosters entrepreneurship, and that is where ministries like mine are working on. We are about to roll out in the next couple of days additional funding. The entity they find access mm -hmm. and as okay. instructed that part of the resources must be used towards developing a culture of entrepreneurship nice. among our younger innovative individuals. Nice. You have to take the chance with them. Like in, in terms of the app development, because mm -hmm. the market would be more um, for what we do is in, in the North American market, when he starts to go into the global market, that's where then he can bring it back home and mm -hmm. go through the structure down here and utilize the structure down here in, in the entities that you don't perceive as being big market players. Mm -hmm. Like the same Chile, the same you know, Argentina, Colombia, the whole, we, we have big neighbors, the south of us, we don't always have to keep looking north. Yeah. We have neighbors yes. so. It was interesting to hear, <coughs> very, very, very good, yeah. very good. Talk about Ireland and its advances with respect to attracting Silicon Valley firms and Netherlands as well as a major spot. But you have the, the uh, ECGA, the European Court of Justice, literally going after Apple right now. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I was saying, I even said so on Brass Tax a couple months ago, this printing and investment our data should be flying over Silicon Valley and saying just pass some restructure through here. I said that the, the European Court of Justice and respect that Apple not not and the heavy fine of billions of dollars mm -hmm. imposed on them was because they felt fundamentally that those entities were not necessarily doing the part of the business of substance in jurisdiction. So where really is the business taking place? Apple, man, Apple manufacturers in Ireland. Yeah, but they, their issue was, was more in terms of continental Europe. Apple, Apple Ireland issue, uh, in my respects today, was the rate of tax. Yes. That was being yeah, charged. Yeah, and, and, and our rate of tax is a little lower right. than, than Ireland is. Now, one of the issues that Ireland has faced, and we've been asked about in my is where we know is the convergence, right. tax convergence. Uh, should we converge to two and a half or twenty five percent and bring everybody up to a five percent tax rate right. and whatnot? I don't think many of us have found favor of that that is yet. But that's about to earn is also mm -hmm. in the guessing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one is, um, in terms of opportunities and I and I don't know the question is how do we capture some of this? Mm -hmm. But we have a situation where the country that is driving the whole issue with FATCA and, the o and signed on the OECD, which is America, they have not signed on to it. So they don't, so they don't respond to the same rules and, and transfer information. And one of the posts I made today was that if someone from the US tells you that we're a tax haven, the answer is no, you are. <laughs> Especially Delaware, <laughs> never had it. So I, I, I checked some stats where they said, they're, they're saying that the USA is, is a new Switzerland. Yeah. Mm. And, I, and I just gonna one stat. Uh, Sioux City, South Dakota. Yep. Has a that has a population, I think the old South Dakota has a population of eight hundred something thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah. Their yeah. trust, the, the level of trust that they have in there went from in two thousand six from thirty two billion dollars to in two thousand fourteen to two hundred and twenty six billion dollars with mm. a lead. Value the trust there. Like, yeah. Is there any way of getting some of that 
Is, do we have any ability to get our, our, because of how America has it structured, they have, they bully the rest of the market and, and to open up the doors for them? No, because there are places like um, Nevada. Nevada, the Australians have set up a bank yeah. right in the middle of Apple's hedge fund. Mm -hmm. and, all, and, yeah. and, and they have, and through Delaware, so they have, in my mind, been sanctimonious in terms of trying to, to, to get us to convert. And, throw up the, and they're the worst offenders. How do we, in Barbados, we only need one of them buildings. We only need 220 sections. How do we get some of that? Can we get some of that? Yeah. Um, I, that's a lot of that's driven by, again, the confidentiality now that that provides to those investors. Whereas they were using numbered bank accounts in Switzerland and so on before. Now with the US not willing to exchange information, they have become a, a confidential jurisdiction in which to operate. Uh, in, I guess it depends on where those funds are coming from, because you know, we, and and um, if we're already committed to exchange of information and so on, so. Totally depends on the the driver for why people want that that confidentiality. Mm -hmm. I think you may be asking two separate well, separate in some respect into it related matters. The US has a, a regime and perspective at the federal level, yes. which they use internationally to say we want greater transparency, we want better exchange of information, we want factory, we want all of these things. But then at state level, yeah. the states will tell you, we don't give a damn what happens yeah. at the federal level, yeah. we set our own rules. Yeah. And that is what has emerged out of the corresponding banking issues, for example. The regulators in New York City and perhaps in Florida to a lesser extent have imposed severe penalties yeah. upon banks operating in their states, yeah. which may not be in sync with the perspective, for example, held by Obama and the White House yeah. at the federal level. And that is an internal running battle that's way beyond our control and our pay grade in smaller states. <laughs> we therefore have to fight with the federal level perspective in the global arena. And, and that's where battle lies. In terms of attracting more of these kind of entities that you talk about, um, I think Barbados is getting a fair share. But we need to recognize that there's a bigger market up there and we need to just take your way up in it. Uh, so we continue to create the right kinds of structures and new structures to attract the business. Hedge funds um, and some of the other structures you talk about, we have a good trust trust system here. We, we recently, a few years ago, we created international trust, for example. But you see, sometimes you have a product here, but the challenge lies in what a potential source may have as their own rules of engagement that will allow the business to come into jurisdiction like Barbados. So billions of dollars may stay within the U.S. because it becomes disadvantageous to take it out of the U.S. So individual states in the U.S. will create their own suite of incentives. The bulk of the businesses in Delaware are not from outside the U.S. Mm -hmm. you know. They are from within Delaware. And you dare take that business out of Delaware and move it to Cayman Islands, you may have a whole different kind of fish to deal with. So it could be a pretty complex issue sometimes. Mm -hmm. I, they're a terrible moderator today because they did not even realize we've gone over the time, but person, questions are still coming in. One from Shane Lowe. Some years ago, there was some talk of a Caribbean institute to be set up for educating students on financial risk to brand the Caribbean as a world-class international financial center. What's the latest on that? That is something that we still passionately believe must happen. But as a reflection of the disconnect that exists in think we cannot get into the States. <laughs> To agree on some basic issues. Oh, the Caribbean is in dire need of a Secretary for Financial yeah, Services yeah, yeah, yeah. that will pull together all of the perspectives, external and internal, exogenous adult, factors, endogenous factors, and look at how we can create the right kind of narrative to take out in the international arena. Also, identifying the opportunities and how we pursue them, the education at the regional level, and such like. You'll be amazed that many CARICOM states do not think international business and financial services is a significant part of the economies. Mm -hmm. 
until the banks start to be shut down mm -hmm. by U.S. authorities, then it comes freedom. Mm -hmm. um, so the simple answer, it is something that we must do. We should have done it a long time ago. Barbados has pledged its commitment. I've said we put up some money to get it done. We've talked with Caribbean Export about the, the, the appropriate facilities. I've had some conversations in the EU. There's a Barbadian in Europe who's actually agreed to put up some money. We wanted to do it through UWI mm. because we felt that that has the kind of structure yes. to really make it happen in terms of a, a, a center for financial services. But here again, we had an issue with Bahamas that felt mm. it should be located in Bahamas. Mm. You know, and, and so it's, it's so a little bit of ego know. in there too. A bit of ego. People need to stick it with a pen. <laughs> and we have a statement and question from Leslie Taylor. Word is that government isn't allowing any more local business foreign exchange accounts. Also understand that if government needs foreign exchange, it can take the funds from these accounts and convert to local. She's asking if this is true. Oh, I don't think the latter is, is well, entirely correct. That's what it is. Once you're granted permission of a foreign exchange account, you can't just yes, see what you do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know that this, the, the state is not disallowing such accounts from opening. I think what we may have realized in, 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 in a recent year or two is an increase in the number of applications to sell accounts um, um, by, by individuals, by entities who may not otherwise have need them. And therefore, the central bank has a duty to protect the financial integrity of the economy and therefore will exercise um, the, uh, due to diligence and work in deciding who should get it. But that is a question that perhaps the central bank is best suited to provide the statistics and, and details on. If we, if we go back to the actual international business and get back more into the opportunities, we went through all the challenges. We know that um, Trump is saying that he's going to lower the tax rate to 15%. Mm -hmm. We know that the, the, the bigger countries are trying to eat in and, and try to get, um, they, they're seeing this as we mentioned before, the 70 billion and they want to get at it. What do you say is the health of the international business sector now and, and how do you see how do you see it in the next two years, how do you see it in the next five, how do you see it in the next ten? Um, the as my minister said, opportunities always come up. Uh, we had a particular opportunity in December where we capitalized on a significant number of new businesses coming in. Uh, we expect that to have a, a very significant impact on tax revenues over the next year or so that will start to come through. Um, and as uh, I mentioned before, I spread, talked about the base erosion and profit shifting and what opportunity that is for Barbados. That's something that we, we, as those rules become more and more clarified and people continue to make changes, tax practitioners will always find ways to um, be most efficient with our tax spend. And I think we have continued to have opportunities there. And with substance being the key to base erosion and profit shifting, if someone can save $10 million in tax and before they have to spend maybe a million dollars to save it, and now they need to spend $4 million, but they can still save $10 million in tax mm -hmm. because they need to put more substance in Barbados. Mm -hmm. That's good for Barbados, but they're still netting $6 million, so they would still do it, right? I think I would add to that quickly that opportunities lie in expanding the businesses we have here now. It's not always about attracting more business that, that must happen. But as Greg is implying, I don't think we're getting enough out of the ones that are here. We are not, as I said to staff in other places, we need to go to these entities, understand what they're doing, and then say, well, how can we add more value? Take, for example, I had a chat recently uh, who, whose business is here in Barbados and have been here for nearly 20 years. Mm -hmm. And they own about 100, own and operate about 100 ships around the world. Nice. And I'm like, <coughs> why? Why are these not the industry? Exactly. Issues that we mentioned the national transport. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now that's a work in progress. Exactly. But you know, the, you know well, perhaps it's because of other jurisdictions you know, we can be bothered to investigate it. But we need to start looking closer at what we, who we have here now and saying what value can we add to your, to your area. Then we also have to find some niche areas and everyone after them. 
Okay. Another question coming in from the audience, which I'm surprised it didn't come up before, and I will modify Joseph Herbert's question a bit. What are the biggest obstacles to the ease of doing business? <laughs> yeah. You know, the ease, we've, we've taken the World Bank report now and use it as a Bible for the checking business. It's, it's, it's one of the few statistics that we have. Uh, and I'll say to you that uh, uh, quite a bit of what is in that World Bank report is grossly misleading. Based on what? And I've, based on evidence from ministries. And the World Bank has been written over and over again and say you're erroneous. You know that the World Bank officials have overcompiled that report, have never had a conversation with me or my ministry, or the Minister of Finance or his offices. Where did they obtain the data for or their statistics? primarily for individuals who are disgruntled with the system. That's, 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 the, that's the fact. It's now, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying don't take this as a defense of, of the situation, but this, right. because mm. we all know without the World Bank report, that we should be doing better when it comes to business. Agreed, especially with... But I'm saying that look, when the World Bank, for example, says mm -hmm. that it takes 18 days to incorporate a company in Barbados, sure they do it on the basis that there are five or six steps towards incorporating, mm -hmm. and they attach a number of days per step. Don't take in consideration that, the, that these steps are done simultaneously. So you can submit all of your documents one time mm -hmm. and have a company incorporated within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Same thing with insolvency issues that we've written and explained to them. What is needed to be done? Better use of the technology. We also need to have a fundamental change in the attitude of public officers and the system. And I work with it every day. Mm -hmm. And there's nobody who more frustrated with public officers and the system of public officers themselves do. But when you get a, a, an attitude as though private enterprise is a nuisance, as though we don't need private price to get our salaries paid on a monthly basis, then we have a problem. A part of the challenge lies in that misunderstanding of the role of the state versus private enterprise, for mm. example, and a culture that says we have a security of tenure so we can do what we want. There's too little accountability in the public sector. And I dare say it has to start at my level as minister too. Here, here. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not ashamed to say that. Uh, but we can bash all these things and say, hey, there are water the things that are it, being Right, done. it's not about bashing, it's about, okay, we take the lash, how do we move on from here to improve? We just last week, this week alone, the Minister of Finance launched a single window mm -hmm. uh, to, to address a lot of the tax paying uh, entities around here. That is a significant step in direction to ease the basis of our base. Mm -hmm. Common affairs have done their part and there's still more, more to be done in terms of the use of technology. Mm -hmm. uh, um, they, they, and, and we can, we want to say, I saw a note where we approved some additional funding, I think over the ADB, under the competitive program, 500,000 US or so, to roll out business facilitation enhancement programs uh, in the public sector. I just think each department needs to ask themselves, how can we do better? Why should people be standing in line to do business? What more can we do online in, 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 in this country? I think, very possible. I think one of the challenges that I, I've heard through the, uh, I think Greg would have to be more in tune with the business, you would have, you have lawyers and, and accountants who would do work and try and, in, in some areas with different businesses or getting them here or doing something, and then you en encounter challenges in terms of getting these things done, and what they end up with is a big receivable because if, if the company is never set up, the, the, the lawyers and, and the only thing they have is time, which is their available time, and they can't recover that from a company that hasn't been set up. And um, do, do you see that as being some of the challenges? I, it all comes back to the ease of doing business and getting things done in an uh, efficient manner. I think the minister addressed um, a lot of the, the um, issues with that there. Um, we have, within Viva, what we've been trying to do is actually work closely with the um, the permanent secretaries and the and various officers, public officers, to get let them have a better appreciation of of the um, challenges that we have. Work with them to try and understand the issues that they have, because the ministries, quite frankly, also have resource constraints uh, in, in this environment, and. Um, that's, that's also one of the big challenges that we've probably have had with things with the Immigration Department, with the Corporate Affairs Office and so on. And um, I think the resource allocation in those areas, I mean, a lot of them are the drivers or the gateway.
the ways to get in business directly to have the appropriate resources uh, available within those those key uh, positions so that we can get those companies incorporated quickly. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll also add quickly as the last point of this, the private sector is not for blame too. <laughs> when when don't no, think that they're not sufficient. Because when they don't do what they're supposed to do the matter as prescribed, they then go tell the clients is if all the public sector. Mm -hmm. But I think we're gonna spend time on the blame game. We just need to accept that we can uh, figure out how to fix yeah. so have this always for, for improvement. So for final points. Yes. I think we I think this evening we, we covered some good ground. Um, hopefully we've gone away to dispel some of the myths that are there in the in the in the wider economy um, about actually what the international business sector is, what it is, how the relationship between government and, and the and the this particular business sector and and how we can move Barbados for. So for final comments and what we're looking for here within this group is not only the education, but we want to know how can we push Barbados forward, like, you know, how, what, what, what can we ask, you know, can we, sometimes holding ground is, in, in this kind of economy is, is, is going forward, so do we see us growing the industry, do we see it being stagnated, or what positive that you can tell our viewers then? I think there are definitely opportunities to grow it. Uh, uh, we have seen a, a couple come up over the last year or so. We expect to see the fruit of that coming through in the year ahead. And um, I think there are a few areas that we can make little tweaks to legislation that may provide for the opportunities. And uh, I had discussions with the minister on that and we have taken a little through joint policy. There are a few other legislative products that. I think that we can make tweaks to that will also improve our attractiveness. The limited partnership legislation mm -hmm. is one um, that I, we are looking to put together a, a business case for some changes there. I'm hoping to get that into the joint policy working for consideration as well. So, I mean, there are opportunities. Back to the said, prevent presents a big opportunity for us competitively versus some of our other our companion jurisdictions. I, so, th I think that's a hard to the mm -hmm. point. Um, we continue to roll up new products to address the, the, the demands of the industry. The living that little partnership is one that we are pretty advanced on. The real estate investment trust as a new product that we also run up to to respond to these mm -hmm. these these demands. I'm a beat about the sector. I'm very, very positive about this, this international business sector for Barbados. I think Barbados is poised in the next five to ten years to become the wealth management center of choice in the, in the Caribbean. Uh, I think we have the fundamentals in our architecture infrastructure uh, to make it happen. We are probably gaining a better reputation in the international arena. For example, the Global Forum with a great deal of are from being partially compliant to being largely compliant. Okay. We need to invest in being where the, the market is most, let our voice be heard. We champion for the small financial centers around the world. Uh, I, I just, I'm just very positive. I think that the future for many of our young people lie in the international business and financial services sector. Okay. All right. We'll take this opportunity to wrap up because we've gone over our time. I saw some of the comments coming in and the latter stage seemed to be a bit political. So I will encourage everyone to tune in <laughs> tomorrow. Yes, tune in tomorrow I when... Tomorrow. Yes, Jeremy <laughs> has a session that's going to be very interesting and remind us of the time. Oh well, yeah, man, that's 8 p.m. tomorrow on my Facebook channel on Reality Weekend. So we have the Honorable Minister once again and you get to... Not pummel, but respectfully, yeah. yes. respectfully, respectfully challenge. Yes, respectfully challenge. Oh, no, that's all right. I'm a politician. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I don't want to be a politician. <laughs> but, but we, must, we must thank um, yes. Greg, of course, Greg right. for coming this evening. And we have special yeah. thanks to Mr. Minister at the last minute who came here and yes. adjusted his karaoke schedule <laughs> for, to share us here. Famous <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I will thank you for coming into my home and you. making yourselves comfortable and sharing with the public. They were very engaged. There were lots of questions and 
I hope you're ready for tomorrow because tomorrow may be a bit more rough. Okay, did you hear that? You guys asked for Mr. Innes, the Honorable Innes. You got him and he came on board. Jeremy got enough strings that he could pull apparently because I, I'm very glad that he got all of these ministers on board and that we'll be able to ask them the questions that have been burning. So prepare yourselves and thank you again for joining us tonight and we look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.